Joining us now to discuss is Masari CEO, Ryan Selkis. Hello there, Ryan. You've written a 134-page monstrosity, your words, uh, describing your annual theses for 2022. What's the TLDR? Well, that was actually last year's uh, that I described as a, a monstrosity at 134 pages. So this year's is actually 165, uh, which uh, I guess is is more than a monstrosity. But um, I think uh, this has been a wild year, obviously, uh, and uh, and we're excited about what's to come. Uh, the the biggest theme, I'd say, there, there's probably three themes. One. Um, is just what's happening in the broader context of uh, the world and, and the markets. I think you know, trust in institutions continues to decline, whether that's in uh, mainstream media, whether that's in politics, um, the disconnect between tech and, and you know, general uh, the political sphere and social sphere. Um, I think there's a trust deficit and, and that opens the door for a lot of the uh, innovations that, that we've been talking about for years within crypto. Um, so you've got the uh, kind of problem solution match, and I, I think the, the kindling for for some real continued progress. Um, the second key theme is uh, how many of the building blocks are, are fully in place now, right? The the currency markets are liquid, the stablecoin markets are are, are liquid, and, and that infrastructure is is very robust at this point. Um, you've seen uh, decentralized finance applications uh, now scale for the better part of two years, and and. Uh, DeFi is actually in a, a secular bear market um, since the beginning of the year. It's, it's flat or down uh, for the most part versus Ethereum and, and some of the other um, comparable assets. But um, during that time, you've seen a lot of sophisticated players come in. And um, the same can be said with uh, with NFTs, which have obviously had their moment this year, um, and uh, and all these other you know, layer one and, and layer two scaling solutions. So you basically have like scaling, uh, decentralized financial markets primitives, this new primitive uh, in NFTs, which allows for all sorts of digital asset trading and IP trading. Um, and then of course, you've, you've got this macro backdrop. So then the third theme I'd say um, is uh, the thing that could end the party, right? Uh, and, and that is uh, overly broad uh, crackdowns and, and restrictions on crypto development within the US. Um, I think the US is very different from China, right? China was able to effectively ban crypto and you know, things just kind of moved right along because I think most people didn't really believe that um, China was ever going to adopt peer-to-peer -peer finance or, or you know, decentralized currencies. Um, I think the U.S. is different. If we see um, some enforcement actions against major DeFi protocols, if we see you know, a, a lot of kind of negative actions from the SEC in particular, but also the OCC and, and Treasury, um, that could, you know, maybe... Uh, prevent uh, the wind from from kind of filling our sails because uh, because people are going to be in batting down the hatches and, and, and defensive mode in, in the new year. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm a permable long term, as, as you know, from uh, having me on a, a couple of times in the past. Um, medium term is a little bit murkier, but um, but I, I think so much of it hinges on whether we're going to get any type of reasonable policy response out of D.C. or, or if they're just going to be indiscriminate with a crackdown in the new year. So, so, Ryan, I want to ask you about that third point uh, about regulators. Where do you see it pragmatically fitting in? Like, like where should they be and what, what are they actually doing? What, what are the things, that, what's the difference between where they should be and, where, uh, and uh, where they are? And what do you think will actually happen in 2022 with them? Um, again, I'll kind of go back to, to three kind of core themes. Um, I, I think the, the first is that... Um, the SEC needs to implement the safe harbor uh, because their current approach has just been a catastrophic failure across the board. It, you know, when it comes to enforcement actions, they've basically had zero wins under their belt. Um, the closest thing that that they could consider a win was uh, a minor slap on the wrist for the EOS token sale uh, back in, in 2017. Um, the proceeds of which ultimately were rolled into about $10 billion of, of you know, privatized you know, wealth transfer um, for what is otherwise uh, a a protocol that, that essentially no longer works in large part because the developers had to step away from it lest they look more like a security. So I don't necessarily, uh, I don't fault block one um, for uh, how they've kind of re reacted to, to the situation and how they've defended themselves and, and how they've ultimately parlayed you know, their token sale success into, into a new exchange. That's on the SEC, right? I, I think that's that should be an embarrassment for the entire commission. Um, XRP, they've still got an uphill battle. They're going up against their former chair 
uh, and Mary Jo White, who's who's actually on Team Ripple right now as, as part of these pr um, proceedings. Um, and instead of uh, taking a step back and, and actually you know, acknowledging that the approach isn't working and, and maybe they should seriously consider something like Commissioner Purse's safe harbor, they've outright ignored it. Um, and in my annual report, I, I, I kind of broke down the, the eight point case against um, Chair Gensler in particular, because I think he's been dishonest uh, over the course of the last you know, six months when it comes to crypto. Um, I would love to see uh, them actually review the safe harbor and, and take it seriously and, and consider how that something like that might be implemented because that would um, weed out fraud. It would, uh, I think, set the industry up for success. It would save the SEC a, a lot of time and energy and headache and, and we'd be able to move forward. So I think that's kind of the big one. And then the other two, just really quickly, I think um, uh, we need to see uh, some common sense proposals around stablecoin regulation um, that don't include making every single stablecoin issuer a bank. I, I think being able to leverage banking deposits is, is one thing, um, but technology companies like Circle and, and, and Paxos and others, uh, I think if they're regulated you know, like full-blown banks, it's, that's probably a step too far. Um, my guess is you know, the best case scenario would be something like what we've seen out of Wyoming, where there are specific you know, depository institution charters that are custom fit for crypto companies. These are fully reserved institutions. You're not even relying on the fractional reserve system, but you will have access to you know, the Fed and, and, and you know, be fully integrated um, and uh, give regulators the ability to closely surveil and kind of watch what's happening with these regulated stable coins. Um, and then you know, the last one in just one sentence, I think you know, we need to actively um, fight back against this nonsense narrative of, uh, of, of Bitcoin being this dirty uh, planet destroying uh, innovation when in reality it accounts for you know, half a percent of global emissions and, um, and is getting cleaner every day between the, the pullout of, of you know, China, uh, Chinese miners and, and all the investments that are going into renewables and recyclable energy here in the U.S. and the West. Ryan, that's thank you. That's uh, there's actually quite that's quite meaty. Um, so you, you just phrased that there. all in a relatively diplomatic way. Um, but you know, in your <laughs> report, you actually refer to SEC Chair Gary Gensler as a fraud. Um, so can you explain mm -hmm. what you mean by that? Because that's obviously a very strong word. Well, I, I believe the exact line was, "I think he's a liar and a fraud." So, um, uh, and and I kind of break it down in detail in, in the report, but. Um, I think he was dishonest in front of Congress um, when it came to his answers to uh, Rep. McHenry on the safe harbor uh, and his knowledge of it and, and whether he'd reviewed it with uh, with Commissioner Purse. So I linked to the video. You, you can kind of tell for yourself. Um, I think he's been dishonest about um, his whole approach with exchanges, his line that he uh, continues to trumpet, come in, talk with us, engage, um, is nonsense because most of the big exchanges have broker dealers and, and they're stuck in limbo. Um, so the, the, the broker dealers that they have acquired have not yet been approved to handle digital asset trading. So come in and talk to us, but you can't actually do anything, even though you have these licenses and you've been waiting for our approval. It's, it's absurd on its face. Um, I think uh, there is no person and you know, with with two eyes and, and the ability to reason that would think their approach to the crypto ETFs and the Bitcoin ETFs in particular is anything other than Wall Street friendly and retail investor hostile. Um, so what he's actually engaged in is, is hostage hostage taking when it comes to the approval of the uh, spot ETFs. And um, and the reason that they haven't actually approved uh, a spot ETF like Grayscales or, or, or Bitwise or others uh, comes down to the fact that he wants full uh, oversight and surveillance rights um, for the entire crypto market. And he's hoping that Congress will give that to him or, or he'll be able to finagle his way into that regulatory authority um, using the Howey uh, statute or, uh, or you know, some some guidance from uh, from FSOC, the Financial Stability Oversight Council that is, is largely deferring to him. Um, and there's like, you know, there's pretty much five or six other points that I make in there. Um, but uh, yeah. they're all, I think, equally concerning. And, um, and you know, I guess the last one that I'll end on is um, when we talk about the safe harbor, uh, it's a three-year safe harbor, right? And, and it does um, include uh, reporting provisions for, for some of these early crypto asset projects. Um, the SEC has basically said they're, you know, they're not even going to entertain that or they've outright ignored it. Um, meanwhile, we have, uh, you know, 
multi-billion dollar, $10 billion plus companies um, and and you know, dozens of, of Chinese companies that are listed in the New York Stock Exchange that are you know, not actually submitting themselves to proper audits and have these um, shell companies that were basically the backbone for Enron uh, that they operate out of uh, in, in you know, offshore vehicles and, and somehow U.S. investors have access to those and the SEC's implemented a three-year grace period for them to come into compliance, but not American crypto companies. Instead, they're trying to go after entrepreneurs and, and protocol developers for airdrops. Um, so, uh, look, I, I, uh, I'm not going to back away from what I said. I'll, I'll, I'll double down on it. But the details, I'd say, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll let the writing speak for itself and, and people can make their own assessment of, uh, of what they think about Chair Gensler. I should end there um, by saying, you know, we believe strongly in the SEC mission. There's there's a lot of similarities between our mission at Masari, uh, protecting investors, improving you know, yeah. information symmetry, and um, meeting out you know fraud. Um, I called out Ripple for for some of its practices three years before the SEC actually you know enforced uh, against them in, in, in late last year. So uh, this is not about um, an anti SEC position. Uh, position. There's a lot of great people there that are working on crypto policy. Um, Hester Peirce, right. I, I think, is, is particularly insightful. So um, it's it's not a, a universal criticism. It is, it is very targeted towards someone that I think is a political animal that's trying to abuse his position to uh, ultimately catapult himself into treasury. Well, as you say, a lot of crypto firms are trying to work with regulators, uh, bridge that gap between the crypto industry and DC. But calling Gary Gensler a fraud and a liar, or even Janet Yellen a white collar criminal and grifter. Um, is this type of language doing more harm than good? Is that ever a concern? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I think um, people need to be able to take advantage of their First Amendment rights and, and call out, you know, abuse and, and excess. You know, uh, the, the the Yellen quote that you're referring to is was something that I tweeted over the summer in response to the m mammoth fees that she had gotten speaking for the one or two years that she was in the private sector between public sector roles. And my point with that was you don't get the speaking fees if you're not parlaying, parlaying that, you know, as uh, as influence for when you're actually in a position of authority like Treasury yeah. Secretary. So to leave that aside. I mean, that was that was over the summer. And I think we discussed that previously. Um, we did. But with, um, um, just pivoting. With Chair, with Chair Gensler, um, I mean, it's like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll let that, you know, I'll let the writing and, and, and the case that I made stand on its own two feet. Um, at some point, you have to push back um, when people are being dishonest. So. Uh, I'll, I'll let others that are in the regulatory and policy sphere uh, have a different set of conversations. But when it comes to, you know, kind of telling the truth and uh, courting public opinion, uh, I'll do my thing and they'll do theirs. So, Ryan. You, in your last um, report, you had mentioned or you have mentioned that Bitcoin would hit $100,000 by the end of the year. You know, it, it's it's almost hit. $69,000 this year. So not, you know, not, not quite there, but not far off. What, what's your prediction for 2022? Well, I, I outlined in the report, and, and this is obviously full of caveats in, in terms of you know, what some of the um, political headwinds might look like and, and you know, do we have any type of macro shocks. But um, if you, I think one of the, um, one of the uh, parameters that we look at for uh, w when the the Bitcoin market is is overheated or or you know, oversold um, is something called the um, the market value to realize value ratio, and that basically looks at the um, the current market cap of Bitcoin versus the market cap applying the price per Bitcoin at the time a given Bitcoin last moved, and kind of summing up all the addresses. So if you have a bunch of Bitcoin from five years ago, um, the realized market cap of, of those particular Bitcoin is going to be much lower than the current market cap. Um, and so what, what you want to look at there is um, any um, uh, move above three in that ratio uh, is, is typically like a blow off top and, and, and a cyclical high. Um, anything below uh, one, say, is uh, is you know, has, has been a, a historic opportunity to, to buy. So, you know, basically the parameters then would be somewhere between um, 
you know, 40,000 and 120,000 would be the one to three ratio right now. Um, so I, I still think it's you know completely in the realm of, of possibility for us to see um, a you know, 125, $150,000 Bitcoin, because that would be this market cap to realize value ratio of three, which, which usually is the high. Whether that's sustainable is a different story, but um, I, I think you know, historically that's been a pretty good proxy for um, uh, momentum and, and kind of how, how hot things are getting. So Ryan, uh, I, you know, please don't hold back on anything here because I, I, I have a question about stable coins. Um, you, you, um, you, getting back to what you were saying and the role of the SEC and, and whether or not stable coins should be regulated as bank, isn't, isn't it really that there are a couple of actors, one in particular, which isn't as transparent as the market would like it to be, but nonetheless uses it for its own means? Um, wh mm -hmm. Where would where would that fall? Like, how, how would you regulate that? I mean, how would you regulate an overseas company that is purposely opaque um, and where the customers don't mind it and actually want it to be that way? What happens there? Well, you're referring to Tether, and, and I think the whole um, issue with Tether Maybe. is it's a... Um, I don't want to call it a necessary evil. I'd say it's a byproduct of, of poor policy in the West when it comes to um, crypto regulation and, and integration of the financial system, right? Um, you've had dozens of companies that have applied for bit licenses. You've had, you know, half a dozen exchanges that have, have you know, um, actually acquired broker dealers and applied for the appropriate you know, licensure. Um, and uh, still, you know, kind of 13 years into the development of this ecosystem, um, you've got basically no guidance from the uh, banking regulators as to how banks can interface with crypto companies, right? That's naturally going to create a dynamic where you need some ability to, to get into dollarized assets because you know, that's, the, that's still the unit of account globally when it comes to trade. Um, so I, I would say um, there's a big opportunity for uh, regulated stablecoin issues, issuers, and we've already seen this with Paxos and their partnership with, with DM. Obviously, we've seen this with Circle and, and its explosive growth. Um, but you know, with Tether in particular, I don't think that demand is going to go away until there's um, real uh, honest engagement from Western policymakers um, over you know, how to bring this uh, technology and, and how to bring these assets under a common sense you know, regulatory framework. Um, I think it's, a, it's you know, an unfair criticism for you know, regulators, policy leaders to say that this is the Wild West and, and you know, the industry needs to come into this you know, uh, regulatory uh, regime when the guidance to actually do so has not only been unclear, but it's been actively uh, blocked or, or, or encumbered by the fact that um, there's just no movement on, on the, the regulator front. So um, I think uh, in, in that respect, you know, there's a reason that the major crypto institutions want uh, Tether to exist and, and continue to support it, even though it's uh, it's certainly imperfect. Um, and, uh, and 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 I think you know, the, the entire world would be better suited if uh, if we had more transparency into its reserves. And you knew that its reserves were um, unseizable because uh, it, it's still a little bit of a shell game where, where these you know, assets actually live. Um, I think people deal with it right now because it is riskier to do business with Western governments than it is with a, an incumbent crypto player that's historically made a lot of money and, and, and ultimately um, made good on its, uh, its depository um, uh, you know, requests when, whenever someone has come to redeem. So um, again, I, I think that's more of an indictment of, of our current political and, and regulatory system um, because uh, I don't think anyone in their right mind would prefer a, uh, a wild west, uh, you know, hundred hundred billion dollar you know, stablecoin issuer versus uh, something that could seamlessly function with the rest of the financial system. Balls in their court.